Amen. Give me you. All right, let's give him some praise. Somebody out there want to praise him. Everything else can wait. All right, now, y'all, y'all can do a little bit better now. I know it's a Monday evening. Give me you. I was talking to Brother Lovett up here. We not worked all day. Come on. Y'all, y'all give it up for it. Lord, give we want to welcome y'all to Pleasant Grove African Methodist Episcopal Church Camp Meeting 2020. And 2020 has been a year. Amen. But we are here to see the camp meeting, and we are blessed for it. Can I get an amen? Amen. It says, still on the journey, the best is yet to come. And I heard that before, the best is yet to come. So y'all hold on. We're going to have tales of Taylor Creek, Willie, and Cypress Slash. Tell them so they will know. Now, we may be small in number, but we still can praise them. Amen. Amen. All right. Again, my name is Joe Ford. I will be your worship leader tonight, and we're going to have a hallelujah good time in the name of the Lord. We are going to go ahead and get started. I believe all the members are here for the devotion. Amen. So we will now have a devotion by our brothers Donald Lovett, Roscoe Frazier, and your very own, the mayor, walked out there, Brother Larry Baker, in that order. Check, check. Oh, there he is. All right. Let me try. Does that work? Can y'all hear me? Check, check. All right. Harrison, Harrison. Well, not the cotton down. Thank you so much. It's good to be here on this uh, camp meeting uh, service. On this camp meeting service. Good morning. Okay. Hot job. And to have you all here, and especially have our legends of Taylor's Creek, Willie, and Cypress Slash here with us. Can we give God a hand of praise for those persons who are here? We don't take them for granted. I need to move down. We don't take them for granted, and we really appreciate them devoting their time and uh, to share with us some of the good stories of what's happened back in what we call the reservation. Young folk, they call it the reservation, the reservation, what is now called Fort Stewart, Georgia. Let's, let, let's, just, let's, let's do a... Uh, I'll do the prayer, and then we'll just start with a song, Baker. But Martin, do the scripture, then we'll have another song in that order. Can we pray together, please? Lord God, we thank you this day for how you brought us, how you kept us, how you've never left us. We thank you, O God, for being who you are, and that you woke us up early this morning in due time. Our golden moments roll on just a little while longer. For that, we say thank you, God. Thank you, God, for life, health, and strength. And my uncle used to say, such as it is. So such as it is, God, we thank you. But it's good, God, because somebody can't do the things we can do. So such as it is, God, we thank you, God. And we claim it, God. And we just, we just give you praise for it, God. If somebody don't know what day it is. Somebody, uh, eyes cannot see, legs cannot walk, tongue cannot. God, so we thank you, God. We give you the honor and the praise, God, for who you are. How you move in a mighty way, God. How we feel your presence. Even right now, God, we don't need a church fool to say thank you. We can say thank you all by ourselves you. for your power, for your mighty works, God. God, for the sunshine and for the rain. God, we say thank you. Thank you Hallelujah. Right. Even in the middle of a pandemic, God, we can say thank you. We're blessed anyhow. Ain't no pandemic going to keep us from praising the God that we serve, who has all power in his hand. Ain't no pandemic going to steal our joy. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. And the world, sure enough, can't take it away. This joy down in my soul right now in my sanctified soul there's joy in my sanctified soul there's love in my sanctified soul there's peace god you gave it you got nobody but you the song said nobody but you lord nobody but you was i was in trouble you brought me over nobody but you lord tonight god we just said thank you a big old great old thank you god for who you are right now god the country may be in turmoil but we know god who we know the God that we serve. Yeah. We know whose hand everything is in. The scripture, says, the scripture says you don't see the birds worrying, do you? You see the birds chirping every day. God, if the birds are all right, God, surely we are all right. Ah, uh, his eyes on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. He watches me. When I'm on the dangerous highways and byways, he watches me. When I'm asleep at night, he watches me. In my hospital room, he watches me. Wherever I am, God, you watch over me. And you're so kind to that, God. We're so glad, God, 
Tonight, we want to take this time to give you all the honor and the glory and the praise. Bless this place, God. Bless us tonight as we move forward in your name, God. God, not yet, but when you do that, we be careful to give you all the honor and glory and the praise. And the people, people of God say amen, 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 amen. and amen. amen. Lord, I thank you, thank you, thank you for my journey. Lord, you brought me from a mighty long way. A mighty long way. Lord, I thank you, thank you, thank you for my journey. Lord, you brought me from a mighty long way. Lord, I thank you, thank you, thank you for my journey. Lord, you brought me from a mighty long way. Nobody but you, Lord, nobody but you, oh, nobody but you, Lord, yeah, nobody, nobody but you, when I was in a trouble. Nobody but you, Lord. 
Tell them sing another one. <laughs> All right, but we're not we're not here for the singing. We come back another night for that one. But we we certainly enjoyed that. All right, next up is our welcome, and that'll be followed by a song. And the welcome will be done by our very own sister Charlotte Lovett Norman. Amen. Amen. He brought me over. Nobody but you, Lord. Nobody but you. It's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Amen. We truly thank God, amen, for another opportunity to come before you today and to let you know that you're always welcome into the house of the Lord. Here at Pleasant Grove Amy Church, it's been going on a long time. And every time, every round goes higher and higher. Regardless of where it looks like right now, amen. We may not be in the building, amen, but we are the church. So wherever we are, amen, that's where the Lord will be. And his spirit dwells there within us. So on tonight here, amen, you're going to hear some stories, amen, that have been told, some that have been untold. And somebody may tell you something that you haven't heard before that may just give a little highlight of what it was like back on Taylor's Creek, where they began um, from the reservation, amen, what their childhood was like what their everyday life was like, amen, what the church life was like, man, what your uncle and, and grandmama and, and great-grandmama known was like, amen, and as they were talking about, amen, the times when you had to live off the land and whatever your medication was came off the land. It wasn't no doctors back then, amen, they had midwives and, and whoever that knew, amen, the, the, the remedy, amen, they just did what they had to do. So tonight we want you to just enjoy Amen. And to record some of these things, write them down so our young people would know. They just said, let them know 
so they can tell somebody when they get older, amen, to carry the legacy on the Pleasant Grove. So on behalf of our pastor, Reverend Johnny e. Morris, amen, and the First Lady, and to our ministerial staff, our officers, members, and friends, we once again welcome you to our annual camp meeting, 1922, well, is it 1922? 2020, amen. <laughs> I'm going to take us back a little bit, amen. But amen, like I said, you have to remember where you came from. Amen. But this year, amen, we want you to enjoy yourself and to be blessed and to enjoy the service. And on behalf of Pleasant Grove Amy Church, amen, you are welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. Before we get to our selection, I want to go ahead and get our uh, honorees seated up here. We, we're going to go in this order. Uh, we have Sister, is it Mamie Jeffrey? Oh, I'm sorry, messing up already. Uh, presiding Elder Retired, Henry Frazier Sr. I think I've seen him in the house. And then next up will be Sister Carrie Mobley. And my paper says uh, Sister Henry Baker but Sr., but we know the Henry Baker Sr. And I think I saw him in the house. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Sister Mamie Jeffries, I think Brother Lovett told me, She's 93 years old, so he gave her a, a he gave her off this year, amen. And once we get Brother Baker seated, we'll have the uh, song selection. It's another day's journey. All right, we ready? All right. Am I singing this song or we got somebody singing? Oh, because man, okay. This is a song that was uh, mentioned as a, a good song for this event. So we're talking about the journey. The theme is that uh, the journey continues, the best is yet to come. So we're gonna, it's not one that the cousin has to do, but one that's a uh, congregational song. Y'all just join in and help us out. Just a little bit. Well, it's another day's journey, and I'm glad, so glad about oh, it. And I'm glad, so glad about it. Well, I'm glad, so glad about it. It's another day's journey. And I'm glad, so glad about it. Know that I'm, I'm so glad, glad to be here. No, he woke me up this morning, and I'm glad, so glad about it. Yes, I'm glad, so glad about it. Oh, I'm glad, so glad about it. This morning, and I'm glad, so glad about it. You know that I'm so glad to be here. You know he gave me health and strength, and I'm glad, so glad about it. Yes, I'm glad, so glad about it. So glad about it. No, oh, he gave, gave me health and strength, and I'm glad. So glad about it. Oh, and I'm so glad to be here. It's another day's journey, and I'm glad. So glad about it. So glad about it, Lord, I'm glad. So glad about it. It's another day's journey, and I'm glad. So glad about it. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I'm so glad.
for the main event, uh, we will have a poem by Sister Paulette Robertson. Is she here? Okay, since she's not here, we'll go ahead and get into the program. All right, so Tales of Tales Creek, Willie, and Cypress Slash. And again, our panelists are Presiding Elder Henry Frazier, Sr. <laughs> Sister Carrie Mobley. <laughs> and Brother Henry Baker, Sr. Amen. All right, now where we're gonna do this is, uh, Brother Lovett told me we got, we got some questions and we're gonna just open it up for some discussion and get to hear some of these stories just like we did last year. And just like last year, we may not get through all the questions, so we want you all to just, you know, when you get a question, just answer it and just keep it moving like that. But under no, you are under no time limit. It is not like the debate we saw the other <laughs> night. Uh, I don't think the gentleman up in the sound booth is gonna turn the mic off on us. <laughs> so so uh, feel free to just express yourselves as best you can. And uh, we are all, we're going to be all ears. So um, I will go ahead and start with our young lady in the middle here, Sister uh, Carrie Marbley. And again, the first, first we will ask everybody to give their name, date of birth, and the place, city or community where you were born. So Sister Mobley, if you could tell us your date of birth, the place where you were born, and, and at that city or that community. I'm Carrie Ma, but I was born uh, in, in, not with the Georgia, but in that area, uh, February 25th, 1929. Amen. And I, I grew up, I was about nine years old, I think, when uh, the soldiers come and ran us out. All right, next up, we'll go on down to uh, Brother Henry Baker Sr. Your uh, name, date of birth, and the place or the community where you were born. I'm Henry C. Baker Sr. I was born in down in Cypress Slash. Yes, sir. November the 19th, 1928. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. All right. And Reverend Henry Frazier, date of birth, city of place, community where you were born, sir. And Mrs. Marbley said she was about nine years old when they moved them out. It was, I, we were about nine, I were nine years old when they moved us out. So, uh, you know, but uh, thank God for the day. Amen. Amen. And, and Reverend Frazier, if you can tell us a little about your uh, grandparents and your parents and growing up, was there any talk about slavery during those times? My, uh, did they? Yes, sir. I don't know, but they didn't say much around me about that because it appears that, um, you know, slavery was really about at the past at that time, but we were still moving. But my folks were so happy to be at Terrace Creek, so they didn't say very much about it. And of course, me being nine years old, um, there was not much shared to me in regards to um, slavery. When I was taught or was said anything to me about slavery because when I was, we were moved out and I was coming here to Taylor's Creek, Joe, Pleasant Grove. Mm -hmm. And then those mothers and fathers would start talking about how we came through slavery. Mm -hmm. and, I was, 
you know, what some of the things that happened. And I did not get too much of that until I became in my 20s, you know, because when I became 16 years old, I took sick. And I was sick for two years. And uh, so in 19, what, 1950, I began to move around a little bit and then I began to hear a little bit more about the slave time and how things were because I was from Taylor's Creek and uh, that's all we knew about Taylor's Creek in Willie, Georgia. <laughs> Amen. Any Amen. other questions? No, we're we going to come back to you. S Sister uh, Kerry Mobley, we want to uh, talk about your grandparents and if, if your parents or your grandparents talked about slavery much and if you could tell us a little about, about your neighbors during that time. Sister Mobley? Sister, Sister Mobley? Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. Take your time. Uh, yeah, I was born to uh, uh, Annie Nelson and Lucy Hill. Uh, her father, her parents was Ben Nelson, some say Benjamin, but we, they called him Ben Nelson and Mary Nelson. Mm -hmm. And Mary Nelson was the offspring of the Collins. She told me that her, her father was uh, Peter Collins. And her mother was Sylvia Moody. Mm -hmm. So that made me have a lot of people here in Hinesville now from one way or another. Then she was connected to the Blakes. Her mother was connected to the Blakes. And my grandfather was connected to the Martins. He said his, his daddy was Peter Martin, mm -hmm. and his mother was, uh, I can't think of the name right now. But anyway, he, he did tell me that. So that made him then, he was kin to the, how he became a Nelson <coughs> was by marriage. Okay. His mother married George Nelson. So he went under the Nelson name, but actually he was a Martin. His father's name was a Martin. So he was kin to the Martins down here. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of them just huge there. But I, I, we was connected, there was, by the communities being close knit, uh, you couldn't just marry anybody. Uh -oh. They they kind <laughs> they kind of <laughs> had something to say about who you married. Watch out now. So so that's you know that's the way they did it. So we we had a close knit community, and when I was coming up, <coughs> everybody. Help raise the child. Amen. It's different from the way it is now. Yes. Because to tell you the truth, most of them were related. <laughs> if you went over in this community over there, somebody knows who you was. You go in that community, somebody knew who you was, and they would they would tell on you. They would they would tell they they would tell your parents about you. So, so you didn't have much wiggle room, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have no wiggle room. So if you messed around coming from school, which I went to Strum Bay School, which was closest to our community, and you played along the road, and some adult happened to see you, they make it their business to stop by your house and tell them that you was playing mm. because they know your parents had told you when you get out of school, you come home. Uh -oh. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's just so much different now, the way it is now. Or the average person don't want you to tell nothing about the child, no way. 
you know, unless you see the police driving in the back of a car. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but the times were difficult. The time was hard. Uh, I was born, I came along after Hoover during that time. And everybody mostly was poor. We were poor. Both black and white were poor people. But most of them was honest people, hardworking people, and God-fearing people, which we don't have now Amen. too much of. Amen. And, uh, and they had something that we, we got away from, loving and caring for our neighbors. You know, people don't care nothing about you now one way or another. But they never did forget if it was time to uh, grind cane. My grandfather had a, a, a cane mill. Uh, they come for the cane grinding. They come for the hog killings, whatever. Mm -hmm. But everybody in the neighborhood had to have some of whatever it was. They would share with people. Just the boxes they're giving out now, COVID made, <laughs> COVID started this. <laughs> So, I, 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 <laughs> so, Sister Mobley, Sister Mobley, could you tell us a little bit about slavery back then? Pardon? Could you tell us a little bit if there was any conversations about slavery back then? Slavery? Yes, ma'am. My grandfather, <clears throat> my grandfather told me that he was in slavery. He was a product of slavery. He said he was 17 years old mm -hmm. uh, when they, I think, when they freed him. And he was telling me about what he told me. It was hard. It, it was horrible because um, you couldn't look up. You couldn't look up, mm. and you couldn't uh, talk back. You couldn't. He said they weren't allowed to go anywhere unless they had a note. You had to have a paper. Mm -hmm. So, and the purpose of the paper was. Uh -huh to let uh, other slave traders, if they see you, you show them that paper, they knew who you belonged to. That way they wouldn't pick you up and take you and sell you again. Mm. Now he did tell me that. He also told me how, how, how brutal they was. And he just, he told me some, wasn't nothing good. Wasn't nothing good about slavery that my grandfather taught me. Cause he told me he had to watch them whip his mother. Mm. And he was a young man. And he say how they beat, how they whipped her till the blood ran down the back. My God. And then they turned around and took salt and rubbed in the wound. Mm. So it, it wasn't nothing, wasn't nothing, wasn't nothing good about slavery. No ma'am. But now, all, all of them, I understand, all of them wasn't bad people. Uh, my, my grandmother's brother, Flem Nelson, which some of y'all know as children, uh, he learned his, the people that had them when he was a little boy, after, after they, they was free, I guess his parents let him work for these people. Mm -hmm. And this lady would have him to get the wood for the kitchen in the fireplace. And before he would go to bed, she would take him and show him how to read and write. And you know it was against the law for you to know how to read and write back then. Amen. You couldn't let nobody know that you knew how to read and write. But this lady showed him how to make her A and how to make her B, how to make the letters. And she taught him how to play the organ. So all of them wasn't bad. Amen, amen. And he in turn, when he was, Grandma said when they would, he would come to them, he would show him, show them how to make the letters. So she knew how to read and write. My grandfather didn't know how to read and write. Mm. But my grandmother did. Amen. Amen. I'm going to jump over to Brother Baker. You were talking about schooling in the slavery days. I'm going to ask Brother Baker 
Brother Henry Baker about school, what school he attended, and if he can uh, give us a little background on how school, describe how school was back then, Brother Baker. Well, back in Cypher Slash, I don't know about <laughs> other places, but in Cypher Slash, uh, you had a school, and you had to be a certain age when you start the school. Mm -hmm. But I was always the boss in the family. I was the baby, and they had, all of them had me room, small. And I wanted to go to school when I was four years old. I, mean, I was Amen. too young. And because I wanted to go, my mom and dad let me go. My aunt was the teacher, one of the teachers. And we had to walk a mile <laughs> to school. Mm -hmm. And every morning, we have devotion, faith thing, and they open up school Amen. in the morning. Mm. Amen. Okay. After devotion, I was ready to go back home. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. My aunt would make my sister walk me back home. And she would fuss with me all the way back. And she was trying to turn around and she crossed the bridge to a place called Johnson Branch. But I know, I know, I was scared to go on home. She had to walk all the way to the, back to the house, then go back to school. And it was the same thing every day. Mm. Mm. And I don't know why I didn't put up with it, but that's what happened. And then, when I finally started the school, my aunt spoiled me. She would call me, we out playing at recess, and she would call me, and she would always have an orange apple or part of a sandwich. She'd give me part of it, and that was back then. Mm -hmm. You see an apple or orange, that was something. Mm. And she would always give me part of it, and then my friend would always come and want a piece of that, and I would share a piece of that with them. But anyway, we went on to school, and when we moved out there, we moved way out there on 196, where we're at now, mm -hmm. and there was nothing but about five houses from there to Highville. We had to walk from out there to school. Mm. Mm. Can you describe the kind of house you lived in back then? Huh? Can you tell us about the house you lived in back then? Oh, yeah. Um, it was uh, from Highville? On, on the reservation. Oh, back on the reservation? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. It was um, on the reservation in Cypress Slash. You had a vicinity of people. You had the Baker Town. Nothing lived in that vicinity but Baker families. Then you had the Johnson Town. Nothing but Johnson. You had to in town. Mm -hmm. Then you had a place called the Big Road. That was the road lead from, uh, would come out, foot out of the, uh, the area and come out at Flemington, right at Stacy Snow. We call that the Big Road. That was the main road coming to Highville. Some, they found, some of the folks lived on that road. Then they had a place to call Possum Trot. Mm. That was down on the other end. There's more people staying down there. But we all had, I heard her say about um, how some were suffering. But I, my family, I don't know whether they had any money or not, but <laughs> we didn't want for no food. Mm. All, of, all of them had farms down there. They had cows, they had chicken, mm -hmm. they had hogs, they had goats, and 
They had grapevines. They had pecan trees. They had peach trees. And you talking about a something good. <laughs> and the peach, you could go, you go under the peach tree and pick up a peach tree. And, and those that didn't have, mm -hmm. they would always share. Yeah. Amen. My mom would, we'd be out playing, we'd be so mad, come here, Lord. And she'd have a bag, so yeah, take that to Hannah. Mm -hmm. We had to stop playing and walk and take that to, we'd take that to Sally. <laughs> that, that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. That's how it was. And, uh, We were this, this, and uh, I remember the, in the summertime, well, the cows didn't have no place to eat. They turned them out in the woods. Nobody would steal the cows. Everybody had cows and they had a mark on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lead cow, they would put a bell on them. Right. And a certain time in the evening, if them cows didn't come home, we had to go out in the woods and hunt them. And then we had to go out and listen for the bell. We, you, you had the bell pound, pound, then we didn't know where that. We'd go get them and drive them home. But most of the time, they would come home in the evening without anybody going after them. And um, it was just like that. And um, But the most of all, I remember after we moved out there in 1948, the camp stood was closed down. I too long not got, I got married. Uh, oldest girl was about a year and a little bit than a year old. And remembering folks too. I wasn't fit to live and I wasn't fit to die. Mm. I was out on the yard. But coming through folks too. Driving the old dinky truck. One of the other truck parked on the side of the road, waiting on me. I had to stop and put off a pole in the first dude. Then I was coming to Hineville, and I didn't have much gas, and I told them to wait on me, but I thought they was gone, and they went and parked right around the curve. The first dude closed down and had bushes rolled off all around the side of the road. They wasn't cutting the grass. They had tall dog felt. So coming with this... Old Dinky had a half a windshield and it was raining, no fenders and the water was shooting up and I was behind this windshield like that. And I come down mm. that curve. Guy stopped on the highway and left like that much of the truck on the road and I hit it wide open. When I hit it, throwed me out. Mm. Guy was with me. The Lord took him on home. He got killed. Told me. The word got out that I was dead too. But the Lord really? told me, you got to straighten up and fly right. Amen. I got work for you to do. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, we're going to jump I'll over to. my life. We're going to jump over to uh, Brother Henry, uh, Reverend Henry Frazier. Can you tell us a little about when you were getting ready to leave the reservation? Just kind of piggyback on what uh, Brother Beck was saying. Do you remember that time, how you felt during that time of transition? Uh, as I listened to Brother Baker and uh, Sister Nelson, uh, I did not see my grandparents. My grandfather on both sides was gone when I was born. Mm. But my grandmother, Irene Thomas, 
four feet tall. <laughs> and she was, she, so, and see, she was not really into it to learn about slavery, so I didn't get what I, what you asking me about slavery, but my grandmother raised me. I was born in her house. And um, my grandmother's first house uh, burned down. And the brothers, like Brother Baker and Sister Nelson was saying, in that during that time, if you if you lose your house, everybody in the community would come and help you get your house back. And since my grandmother, listen to me if you will, since my grandmother was a widow, they built my grandmother a nice house. And my grandmother's house is still going right on. Anybody know where the um Dollar store down there in front of the used to be Coastal Bank. Right behind that dollar store is my was my grandmother's house. My grandmother had a house with two fireplaces. And I was my grandmother's baby, and you know what I got, amen. <laughs> and uh but 